All right. Well, it is just about seven o'clock. I want to thank everyone who has joined us so far. I will um, get a little bit of business out of the way and let, let some people log on. Uh, I know we're kind of uh, very punctual right here at seven o'clock. So thank you so much to those of you who have joined us already. Uh, we used to do this lecture series, Dr. Janos and I started out in person with our Building Bridges Community Lecture at Lenox Hill Hospital. And since COVID has started, we are making an effort to start this virtually. So we are thrilled to have you for our inaugural session uh, here this evening. And the plan is, you know, we're hoping one of the benefits that could actually come about from this uh, is, is the fact that we can continue this virtually. It's a lot easier sometimes for people to just pop on uh, rather than come physically to the hospital. So we're hoping that we can actually expand this program to the whole health system and, you know, really uh, reach the audience that we need to with this and have that be a positive thing that, that can come out from all of the uh, changes that we've had uh, with COVID so far. So um, those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Rachel Narwald. I'm a nurse practitioner and I am part of the preventive cardiology team at Northwell Health, Lenox Hill Hospital. And I work with Dr. Chianos. I have the immense honor of working with her. She is um, uh, my attending physician and really has spearheaded this whole program. And we're really, really thrilled to have you join us this evening. So um, this is gonna be very informal. You know, those of you who used to join us know that uh, Dr. Mintz is going to give us a wonderful presentation and you can feel free to utilize the Q&A function of this Zoom meeting to ask questions at any time. I will be fielding them and will uh, present them to Dr. Mintz as time allows. So you can ask them at any time during the presentation that they pop into your mind and we will make an effort to get to as many of those as possible. And um, I, I just want to uh, thank Dr. Mintz for taking the time out, uh, volunteering your time and your very busy schedule to be with us tonight. We are so fortunate to have Dr. Mintz. Not only is he a titan in his industry, but he is also an amazing speaker, uh, so eloquent, so funny. You guys are in for a real treat tonight, let me tell you. And uh, Dr. Mintz is the Director of Cardiovascular Health and Lipidology at the Sandra Atlas Bass Heart Hospital, which some of you may formally know uh, as the North Shore University Hospital. He is also the co-director of the Northwell Cardiovascular Prevention and Advanced Lipid Disorder Center on Long Island. So he has so much knowledge to share with us tonight. He is going to be giving his world famous talk, Prevent the Event, uh, which he will be talking about heart disease, uh, but as well as tying in COVID, which I know is, is in the forefront of uh, most of our minds today. And as luck would have it, it is actually World Heart Day today, uh, which is celebrated every year on the 29th of September. And it was started, created by the World Heart Federation to bring awareness to cardiovascular disease. So uh, it could not be a, a better night for us to all join together and discuss. So without further ado, I am going to um, just give the floor to Dr. Mintz and uh, you can get started. Well, thank you, Rachel. I appreciate that and the introduction. I think it's also important for us to acknowledge that September is cholesterol month. So between yeah. heart disease and cholesterol month, September is a happening month for those <laughs> of us that want to live longer and prevent the event. Yes. Uh, I think the, the title of the lecture series, Building Bridges, is apropos because it really does take a village, takes a group to prevent you know, cardiovascular disease. So I hope by the end of this evening's lecture, everybody is smarter than I am about heart <laughs> disease and we can look to prevent clinical cardiovascular events. So before we start, we have a survey uh, for the audience. We'll put up our polling questions, uh, which should pop up on your screen. Uh, please answer when you can. What is the leading cause of death in women? Stroke? heart disease, breast cancer, colon cancer, or autoimmune disease. So click your answer for us. Second question is, what are the risk factors for COVID-19? Hypertension, diabetes, obesity, male gender, or all of the above? So we'll just take a second for each of you to click in your answers. 
there's no uh, no bad thing will happen to you for a wrong answer. Don't worry, it won't kick you off of the call. So <laughs> feel free to answer. And I promise you by the end of my talk, you'll know the answers to both of these questions and so much more. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so uh, John, hopefully I have enough answers from the audience if we uh, move on to the next slide. So the focus of our discussion tonight is cardiovascular prevention. I'm going to highlight the scope of atherosclerotic disease for all of us. We'll look at the major cardiovascular risk factors, including COVID-19. We'll look for how we can risk factor reduce clinical risk or risk factor modification, as we say. We'll look at the diagnostic evaluation that we use in cardiology. We'll look at some of the therapeutic interventions available to us. And finally, I challenge all of you in a call to action to prevent cardiovascular events. So that's really the scope of how we're going to proceed for this evening. Cardiovascular disease remains the leading cause of death in the United States. I can tell you that heart disease is increasing and it's important for us to realize that the first symptom of a heart attack in 50% of patients is the actual heart attack. So the first symptom of the heart attack is the actual heart attack half the time. 80% of patients less than the age 65 also have increased risk of mortality, so death from the clinical event. So it's important for us as we realize that cardiovascular disease is prevalent in our population, everyone's at risk, and patients that suffer one clinical event are at greater risk for a second event. So when you go across the country and you survey women and you say, what's the most common cause of death in women, they'll point to breast cancer or colon cancer, but heart disease remains the number one risk for death in women. So cardiovascular disease is the answer to the polling question. One out of three women will die of heart disease. And ultimately, by the end of this evening, we'll focus in on some ways how we can reduce clinical risk in women and men as well. And this was a uh, Time Magazine uh, cover. So learn a lot of medicine from Time Magazine. Now, when you think of atherosclerotic disease, it's a diffuse process. Now, patients may present to us anywhere along the spectrum. They may present with a stroke or a transient ischemic attack, atherosclerosis in the cerebral vascular area. Patients may present with angina or myocardial infarction, heart attack. Patients may present with just peripheral arterial disease where they have pain called claudication in their calf muscles when walking and ultimately can develop other complications from gangrene, necrosis, and so on. So when we talk about atherosclerosis, we talk about cardiovascular risk, cerebral vascular risk, and peripheral arterial risk. And atherosclerosis is a disease. I want you to understand that. You know, we may work in the cardiovascular arena and work in fixing one particular artery, as I'll talk about a little later on today, but there is disease throughout the rest of the arterial tree throughout the body, and that risk becomes important for us. Now, you can see here in this slide, which is a continuing continuum of atherosclerosis uh, through one's lifetime. Many studies have shown us that in young adults and uh, teenagers, there is evidence for atherosclerosis by the time patients are 18 to 20 years of age. And then you get progression of this atherosclerosis throughout the third decade. And then what happens here, by the time you hit the 40s, you can see a nice atherosclerotic plaque present. And the question is, the decade ends at the fourth decade, or the slide ends at the fourth decade, and you say, what happens at this point? What happens at that point, you could have progressive disease, you can have instability of the current disease, and there are other factors that contribute to plaque or common term blockage or cholesterol buildup over time. And what makes that plaque unstable is important for us to identify. There's also something else that happens along the way. There's endothelial dysfunction, which means the blood vessels, instead of dilating, which br brings us more blood flow, constricts. So we don't like when our blood vessels constrict because that brings us less blood flow, less oxygen. So endothelial dysfunction which has been associated with hypertension, it's been associated with diabetes, it's been associated with family history of early heart disease. This is an important risk factor that also occurs 
simultaneously to cholesterol buildup with time. And at the end of the day, what we're talking about is plaque buildup. And you can see here in this slide, anything, you, if you've been to uh, lectures in college and grad school, anything they circle or have an arrow at, that's what they want you to see. So in this particular artery, you see a narrowing over here. You see this patency over here, which is lighter than the white, and that's where you have what's called a thrombus or a blockage. And really what happens pathologically, you have a rupture of the shoulder of the artery, weakest point of the artery, and then a thrombus, this uh, yellow-orange cholesterol buildup, ruptures through into the arterial vessel and then causes thrombosis. So that's where the term coronary thrombosis comes from that our parents used as well. Now, this is another type of slide. So as I told you before, there's arteries that get diseased and you can see this uh, defect here in the filling. See, you know, it should be this wide over here, but then you come to this point in time and sure enough, part of the artery is not filling, that's a blockage. Now, as I just told you before, why do they have the arrow over here? They have the arrow over here in this artery that looks kind of normal. However, when we do something called intravascular ultrasound, this little area of normal correlates to over a 50% blockage of plaque that's forming inside the artery. So this gets our attention because certainly there's a compromise of the artery here. This should get us our attention and emphasize the fact that atherosclerosis is a diffuse disease process affecting the entire arterial tree. So that's why as I said earlier, the most common blockage that causes a heart attack is only a 50% blockage. Now that's important and it's been reinforced to us within the cath lab. And if you look at the data here, looking at the severity of myocardial infarction, a heart attack and stenosis, again, the vast majority of heart attacks happen with a less than a 50% blockage. Okay, so that's an important point. So arteries don't get blocked up and go 50%, 70%, 90% heart attack. They go 50% plaque rupture, heart attack occurs. Now, if I sent you to the catheterization laboratory and you had a procedure and it came back 50% obstruction, the recommendation would be medical therapy. Medical therapy. So medical therapy helps us stabilize plaque and prevent plaque propagation propagation or growth of the cholesterol buildup over time. So that's an important point to know. So while we may look very good in the cath lab and say, oh, 90% blockage, here we go. We're gonna do an angioplasty and we're gonna put a stent inside and look how good we look. But what I've showed you already is that atherosclerosis is present throughout the entire arterial tree. And just because we're working in one area doesn't mean we have to ignore the rest of the arterial as well. So 50% blockage is the most common lesion that causes a myocardial infarction. And it's important for all of us and, and your doctor, again, you'll see, you know, various specialists, you'll see Rachel, who's a specialized nurse practitioner in cardiac prevention, your cardiologist, your internist, and everybody's at risk. So, you know, what I do in my practice, you look at the patients as they come through the door and you want to identify the risk factors and we divide them up into modifiable risk factors, things that we can change, and then there are things we can't change. So on the uh, modifiable risk profile, certainly we have cholesterol. Uh, it's important to know your numbers. LDL stands for bad cholesterol, L for lousy. HDL is your good cholesterol, H for happy. Uh, another way of looking at it, your LDL, L for low. So you want your LDL to be low. You want your HDL to be high triglycerides of fats in our bloodstream, smoking is a modifiable risk factor, high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, and we're gonna talk more about obesity because the incidence is climbing geometrically, atherogenic diet and thrombotic risk factors and sedentary lifestyle. So uh, it's important for us to understand that anything that we do in risk factor change has to start with lifestyle modification, proper diet and exercise non-modifiable risk factors where we're all getting older. Uh, an increased risk factor is men over 45 and women over 55. Men as a uh, individual risk and then a family history of early heart disease, first degree relatives. So if I see a patient that has brother, sister, mother, father with an early cardiac event, 
my ears light up. It's like a pinball machine. Things are flashing. That's someone that we identify and say, guess what? I have to modify all the risk factors noted above. So family history is very important for us. And then you look at the number of risk factors someone has. Now, if you look at this slide, you're looking at the association between systolic blood pressure, your blood pressure, and diabetes, and cardiovascular risk. So if you look at the non-diabetic population in turquoise, as the blood pressure goes up, you see an increased risk of cardiovascular events. But diabetics have a double risk of cardiovascular events as their blood pressure goes up. So if you're a diabetic and you have high blood pressure, your risk of dying from cardiovascular disease doubles. And you can see the comparison uh, between the orange and you can see the uh, climbing as uh, blood pressure increases. So that's important for us to understand that, you know, patients with diabetes are at increased risk no matter what. Now in 2017, there were new blood pressure guidelines that came out. Normal blood pressure is less than 120 over less than 80. Elevated blood pressure was 120 to 129 and less than 80 should be the lower number, diastolic number. Stage one high blood pressure is 130 up to 139. Stage two is 140 or greater. And that's a reversal from what we had earlier where 140 over 90 became stage one high blood pressure. So now if you apply stage one hypertension to our society, you're seeing more than two thirds of patients having hypertension by this type of definition. And that doesn't mean everybody needs to be on medication. It means everybody needs a wake up call and they have to start eating better, exercising more, maintaining proper weight. And we as clinicians need to help patients on that mission to achieve these goals. Because at the end of the day, if you have high blood pressure over a lifetime, this is not a Peter Luger steak you're looking at here. This is a thickened heart muscle that builds up over time. Now what's high blood pressure? High blood pressure is the resistance that the heart has to push against. So if the heart is pushing against a high blood pressure, it's gonna become very muscular and hypertrophied or thickened. Not a good thing. It's great to have a big heart if you're a generous person. It's not a great thing to have a big heart inside your chest. So we need to identify patients with high blood pressure, treat them early on, and then have steak once a week. Uh, this is a common patient we see. Now this is not Santa Claus, nine months pregnant here on the couch, remote control impaled on his hand over here, and he's sleeping. This might be someone we call dysmetabolic, okay? They may have parameters associated with central obesity, Again, it would be quite unique if he really was nine months pregnant, but uh, central obesity, sleep apnea, and uh, basically sedentary lifestyle. So these are patients we call dysmetabolic that come into the office and they have something called metabolic syndrome. Now, how can you identify these people? Well, very simply, men have a waist over 40 inches. Women have a waist over 35 inches. So that's the first thing. Uh, so they're going to have central obesity. They're going to have uh, increased weight circumference. They're going to have high blood pressure. They're going to have higher triglycerides. They're not diabetic. They may have high blood sugar. Uh, they'll have low HDL cholesterol, low good cholesterol, and they'll have small, dense, bad cholesterol, small, dense LDL. So these are patients with metabolic syndrome. And when you see these patients, the presence of metabolic syndrome increases the risk of cardiovascular disease at all levels of LDL cholesterol, but more importantly, increases risk of cardiovascular disease through one's lifetime. And these patients may not or may never develop diabetes, but they have increased cardiovascular risk related to insulin resistance, glucose intolerance, which is associated with being overweight. Obstructive sleep apnea is another risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Now, you don't have to be snoring to have sleep apnea. You may be fatigued during the day. You may be obese. Your neck size may be greater than 18 inches. You may have cognitive impairment. You may have high blood pressure. Usually, we'll see something called resistant high blood pressure, where patients uh, are on three, four different medications and still have high blood pressure. 
Sleep apnea is also associated with palpitations or irregular heartbeats, so patients may have uh, arrhythmias that need to be identified. Uh, and then there's nocturia, and I point this out to you because that's important. If you're a male and you get up two, three times a night or more, the male will say, oh, it's my prostate, you know, my prostate's getting bigger. But really what's happening in many of these males is simply they are stopping breathing. They startle themselves, they wake up and they say, oh, I'm up now, I guess I have to go to the bathroom. So if you have a male come to your office with the right profile and they are getting up frequently to urinate, I would rule out sleep apnea before I worry about prostatism in this patient population. So you have thin people that have uh, sleep apnea, you have overweight people with sleep apnea, so you have to look at the whole package. The other thing that's important with sleep, you need six to nine hours of sleep. Getting too little sleep is associated with increased risk for heart attack. Getting too much sleep can be associated with increased risk for heart attacks as well. But understand that obstructive sleep apnea is also a major risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And what it does very simply is if the heart's not getting enough oxygen at nighttime, it increases the signal to put out a hormone called the angiotensin, which causes vasoconstriction, which causes your blood pressure to rise. So there's a lot going on here in these patients with sleep apnea, and therefore, that's why their blood pressure may not be controlled on three or four drugs. First, dedicate yourself to finding if they are compliant with their medical regimen. If they are compliant, then think about sleep apnea, for patients failing uh, multiple medications for control of hypertension. Diabetes is a significant risk factor for heart disease. And what I like to say is patients suffer from diabetes, but diabetes causes heart attack and stroke. So they suffer from diabetes, but they die from heart attack and stroke. In this data over here, you can see that patients with prior history of diabetes have a higher incidence of myocardial infarction over next seven years. So if they have a prior MI, increased risk for another MI. Uh, patients with no prior history of an MI, uh, in terms of our type two diabetes, well, let's say it a little bit uh, differently. Uh, what I'd like to do here is compare our type two diabetics with those patients with no diabetes. So if you see here, uh, if you had a risk of a prior MI, but you're not a diabetic, you have an 18% risk for second MI. But if you had a prior MI and you're diabetic, you have a 45% increase uh, chance of another MI. If you're a diabetic with no prior MI, your risk is 20%. If you're a non-diabetic without prior MI, your risk is 3.5%. What this is telling us, the incidence of myocardial infarction over seven years is greater in diabetics than non-diabetics. So remember that patients with diabetes die from cardiovascular events. They suffer from diabetes, they get renal disease, they get uh, ophthalmologic disease, uh, but it's very important for us to reduce their cardiovascular risk. Finally, does anyone ever know why breakfast is always smiling at you? Because we know that over time, breakfast will get you, especially if you eat like this every day. Uh, in the Framingham trial, they showed that 35% of patients uh, with uh, coronary heart disease had a normal cholesterol, a total cholesterol of less than 200 milligrams per deciliter. So there are patients with so-called normal cholesterol that go on and have cardiovascular events. But saying that, cholesterol remains a major risk factor for uh, cardiovascular events. And in the year 2020, we have various methods for reduction of cholesterol therapy. Uh, collection, uh, reduction of cholesterol buildup over time with appropriate therapy. So lifestyle modification becomes very important for us. Proper diet, regular exercise, we recommend at least moderate amount of exercise, 150 minutes uh, per week of good aerobic exercise. I like to tell my patients about the rule of fours, 40 minutes of continuous aerobic activity four days per week. We have statin therapy, and statins remain the foundation of cholesterol-lowering treatment uh, available to us because statins lower cholesterol, and they have anti-inflammatory effects, and statins, in fact, may prevent plaque or cholesterol propagation over time, and they may be stabilizing that cholesterol uh, plaque to prevent cardiovascular events. And there's a tremendous amount of data with statins with regard to safety, and efficacy, which means effectiveness of statins reducing 
cardiovascular events, heart attack, strokes, and reducing mortality. There are other non-statin therapies available to us. Azetamide is a medication that blocks absorption of cholesterol in the small intestine. So you poop out some of your extra cholesterol. Uh, a new medication that became available to us April 1st of this year is bempedoic acid, which is a non-statin effective in patients that can't tolerate statin. So it's an oral medication that can reduce LDL or bad cholesterol about 18%. Old school, cholestyramine is a bile acid sequestrant, which absorbs cholesterol in the bowels and also causes you to move it through the uh, colon and out of the body. Fish oil, especially some of the new data with a icosapent ethyl, which is a purified fish oil prescription uh, medication referred to as Vicepa has uh, good data showing reduction in cardiovascular events. So there's a role for fish oil. An oldie, but kind of out of vogue now is niacin. Uh, so we rarely use niacin these days. And certainly for patients that cannot tolerate cholesterol lowering therapy, cannot get to appropriate goal on the above noted cholesterol lowering therapy, there's a family of medications called PCSK9 um, medications, which are injectables. They're given subcutaneously twice a month. So that's kind of our toolbox that we have for improvement in cholesterol uh, levels and uh, reduction of clinical events. So that's important for us, but the foundation does start with proper diet and lifestyle change. Uh, we don't refer to goals anymore. Back in 2003, we were using uh, numbers less than 100, less than 130, less than 160. Now we're looking at numbers in certain patients uh, at high risk, patients with uh, diabetes and, uh, or patients that had prior cardiovascular event or stroke, getting LDL cholesterol, bad cholesterol, less than 70 milligrams per deciliter. Other than that, uh, your physicians may use what's called high-intensity statin therapy or moderate-intensity statin therapy. Uh, filling out the risk of where we are today, COVID-19 has been associated with heart disease, uh, but taking even a step back, who is at higher risk for COVID-19 infection? And in a study out of New York that showed that in 5,700 patients, 57% of patients had high blood pressure, 42% were obese with a BMI of over 30, 34% had diabetes, 11% had atherosclerotic heart disease. So this is kind of the risk profile. And then certainly patients that are obese and certainly patients with diabetes also do worse once they get COVID-19 infection. It's been shown now that the virus also can cause direct cardiac damage. Uh, there's elevation of the cardiac enzymes. Uh, there's inflammation of the heart itself, referred to as myocarditis. There's inflammation of the sac that the heart sits in, referred to as pericarditis. So the virus causes diffuse inflammatory effect, releasing what's called cytokines, which are messengers of inflammation. And this over time could also lead to plaque instability. The virus also causes a hypercoagulable state of damage to the uh, vasculature, and one-third of patients can have thrombosis or venous clot seen uh, with a COVID-19 infection. Arrhythmias or irregular heartbeats have also been noted in this patient population. So when we look at COVID risk, as I said, worse outcomes have been associated with diabetics, uh, possibly due to impaired immune system, uh, think of an inflammatory disease in diabetes causing inflammation, insulin resistance causes more inflammation, and this can lead to an impaired immune system and increased uh, risk for the virus. Uh, obesity, again, due to uh, central obesity, there's more insulin resistance and more baseline inflammation. Uh, patients that are obese may have a uh, affected respiratory pattern. COVID-19 has also been shown to damage the beta cells which secrete insulin. And the risk of death increases four times in patients with a BMI of over 35. Uh, so again, diabetics, obese patients do worse. Hypertension, again, is an incidence. 56% of patients with COVID-19 infection also had hypertension. 
you know, one of the mechanisms of action for COVID-19, it binds to a certain receptor, which causes a decrease in the number of these ACE2 receptors, and therefore one gets an accumulation of this protein or um, cytokine marker, angiotensin II, which causes constriction of the blood vessels, which again leads to more inflammation. So it's a, uh, a virus that affects multiple organs, uh, whether you're talking about uh, the lungs, whether you're talking about the kidneys, whether you're talking about cerebrovascular disease, uh, patients who are susceptible are the elderly, people with cancer that may have uh, or a compromised autoimmune system, uh, patients with autoimmune disease, and as I said, patients with chronic kidney disease. So again, you may see on the uh, left-hand side of the slide, multiple organ effects, including blood clots, persistent shortness of breath, even after patients are done with their COVID-19 infection, patients still will have shortness of breath, they'll have extreme fatigue weeks on, stroke has been associated with COVID-19, impairment of memory, gastrointestinal symptoms, including uh, diarrhea have been associated with the acute presentation as well as the uh, uh, chronic presentation, and then prolonged fatigue. So we're still learning more about the virus, but clearly it's not just a respiratory virus. It's not just the flu. And uh, even though we're talking about cardiovascular risk, it's important. Wear the mask, maintain social distancing six feet apart and wash your hands because certainly uh, the virus can affect others and you need to be mindful of that over time. So. Rachel, I'll stop at this point yes. to discuss the scope of yes. uh, the disease and uh, the risk factors. And before I go into diagnosis uh, and approaches, let's see if you guys have any questions. Perfect. A absolutely. I do have questions. Um, you just touched on the uh, ACE inhibitor and the ARB therapy. Now, we definitely had questions from patients. There was information uh, going around uh, during the course of COVID where perhaps people that were already on ACE inhibitors or ARB therapy were at an increased risk of either having a more severe disease course when getting COVID or being more susceptible to COVID. Uh, I'd love for you to touch on that a little bit for patients. Sure. I think that's a great question. So uh, what Rachel's referring to is the mechanism of action for ACE inhibitors, anything that ends in PRIL, P-R-I-L, or angiotensin II receptor blockers, anything that ends in sartan, uh, herbisartan, telmisartan, losartan, those are called ARBs, and their mechanism of action is to blunt the effect of angiotensin II uh, which you can see COVID-19 binds to that receptor and decreases angiotensin II as well, uh, or angiotensin II receptors as well, increasing the amount of angiotensin around. So what's been shown is that patients that were on ACE and ARB did not do poorly uh, when infected with COVID-19. So the recommendation from the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, all the major societies is that you should stay on the medication. There were no deleterious effects for patients that remained on their ACE inhibitor or ARB. Uh, in fact, one could argue that being on an angiotensin II receptor blocker, a sartan, has an anti-inflammatory effect by blocking the vasoconstrictor effects from the uh, COVID-19 down regulation of the ACE receptors. So in English, uh, being on an ARB may have an anti-inflammatory beneficial effect against some of the inflammatory effect caused by COVID-19. So please do not stop your ACE inhibitor if you get COVID-19 or your ARB. Uh, always discuss this with your physician, but please do not stop the medications. Uh, this has been, again, uh, recommended by all the various societies. Continue your uh, therapeutic medication for your hypertension. Absolutely. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, I think that was very helpful uh, as most of our patients are on these medications. So that was um, a great answer. Thank you. And sort of along the same line of uh, 
preventative medications, uh, you had mentioned that with COVID, there is this increased risk for clotting. And we have a lot of patients that when that New York Times article came out, just in relation to heart disease, they were questioning, should they or should they not be on aspirin? So what would you say to people as far as, do they need aspirin uh, to prevent the event? <laughs> okay, that's another great question. So, uh, so in terms of clotting, Versus prevent the event. So aspirin therapy for primary prevention has been evaluated in recent studies and shown that for a large number of patients, aspirin is not necessary to prevent the event. Now, uh, what's changed over the years is we've gotten very better. We've gotten much better with control of hypertension, high blood pressure. We've gotten much much better in control of cholesterol reduction. So the benefit of aspirin therapy in patients without disease uh, is really smaller and there's an increased risk from taking aspirin with regard to bleeding from the gastrointestinal tract. So the risk of bleeding in this patient population negates some of the benefit. So we don't recommend aspirin therapy for most patients in what's called the primary prevention population. Uh, we can have a discussion about the diabetic population although some studies have shown that the aspirin may not be as helpful in that population. I personally uh, feel there is benefit in the diabetic population, but I may be in a uh, minority of physicians at this point. But patients with cardiovascular disease, patients with prior stroke, patients with coronary disease, patients with coronary artery calcifications, I feel should be on aspirin therapy. Uh, the other part of your question was about uh, preventing clot. So aspirin is what's called an antiplatelet. That's uh, the mechanism that when we cut ourselves shaving, we stop bleeding because the platelets start to stick together. So in patients at risk for clot, let's say from COVID-19, we do not use antiplatelet therapy for that population. We're using anticoagulants or blood thinners. Uh, and this has been well studied back in March of 2020 uh, we didn't know that patients with COVID-19 were having increased risk of clotting and you know, pulmonary emboli, clots in the lungs. We found that out along the way. And in fact, at this point in time, uh, if patients come in and they're COVID positive to be admitted to the hospital, they will look at their D-dimer blood tests, or blood tests for clotting, and if it's elevated, those patients will go on traditional blood thinners, anticoagulants. Uh, those with clots will stay on those anticoagulants uh, for three months to six months after uh, hospital discharge. Uh, so that's important. Uh, and again, uh, aspirin therapy on a case-by-case -case basis to be discussed with your, your physician. Thank you. Absolutely. I think it's such an important distinction that people understand uh, the difference between the antiplatelets and the anticoagulants. You know, we get a lot of questions with this where uh, it's very different where somebody's taking therapy post stenting. Uh, they've been through the cardiac cath lab and perhaps gotten a stent versus they have atrial fibrillation, you know, and they need to be preventing stroke, things like that. So we do get those questions a lot. So that was a great distinction. Thank you. Right. And again, one more point I'd make doctors like to dummy things down, but patients are very sophisticated. So doctors use the term blood thinners. Uh, again, so aspirin and medications like clopidogrel or Plavix, those are antiplatelet medications. And blood thinners, true blood thinners, are warfarin, which is, was referred to as Coumadin when it was a brand. And uh, the new medications called Eliquis and Xeralto, those are blood thinners. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Well, I'll let you move on. I do have some other questions, but I'll let you keep going and, and I'll interject perhaps in a bit. <laughs> right. And for uh, those members of the audience who are shy, I'm not shy. Rachel's not shy. So please uh, send in your questions uh, via the chat feature and Rachel coordinate them uh, so we can uh, answer everything you need to know. And as I said to you at the beginning, I want you to finish up smarter than I am by the end of this talk. So we've talked about the risk of COVID-19. Everybody in our society is always competitive. And as this uh, cartoon says, I've always been a high achiever. I'm always striving for bigger, faster, and greater. And now suddenly I'm expected to settle for lower blood pressure and less cholesterol. So yes, yeah, so all of us type A people, sometimes we gotta go for lower is better. Uh, so how do we find heart disease? 
we can do a stress test. Now, this particular slide is a traditional stress test. Patients hooked up to the electrocardiogram machine, walks on a treadmill, and then we have our EKG machine monitoring his uh, electrocardiogram during real time. The nuclear stress test, which I'll show you in the next slide, is the same type of setup. The patient may be walking on a treadmill if they're capable, or sitting in a chair, and then they use radioactive material to take imaging of the heart. So in a nuclear stress test, you get images like this, and what you see on the left-hand side is bright orange, and that looks good, and this is like an upside-down horseshoe. And then on the right side of the horseshoe, you see this purple area. This is not getting blood flow. Uh, and we compare the stress part of the imaging. So when they're on the treadmill or if they're not walking, we give medication to stress the heart. So we compare the stress pictures to the rest pictures and we say, aha, uh -huh, this looks better than that, or this area of the heart's not getting enough blood flow. So that's a nuclear stress test using radioactive material that you urinate out. There is no dye involved. So that's an important distinguishing factor, uh, nuclear stress testing. The other thing we do is something called a coronary artery calcium score. So the patient lays on the table. There's no IVs. There is no dye whatsoever. It takes about eight minutes. You go into the CAT scanner and it tells you how much calcium is in your arteries. Test takes, as I said, about eight to 10 minutes. I get all my medical information from Time Magazine. You can see the headline here, how to stop a heart attack identify it before it starts, and it's trying to show you calcium in the arteries of the heart. And you can see over here on the image here uh, that this white in the artery itself is coronary calcification. So increased degree of coronary calcification represents an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So in some patients, not all patients, we do use a calcium score to help identify risk over time. So again, this is not for everyone, but if your physician feels I need a little more information to help identify the risk of coronary artery disease, they'll use a coronary artery calcium score. Normal is zero, up to maybe 50. Above uh, less than 100 still is mild disease. 100 to 399 is moderate disease. And above 400 is significant uh, coronary calcification and coronary artery disease. So for some patients, we need to do a cardiac catheterization. Uh, that term is used interchangeably with angiogram, angiography, taking pictures of the blood vessels, that's angio. Uh, catheterization is the uh, use of a catheter uh, to put the, uh, in this case, dye down the arteries and look for blockage. So the other thing to take home from this picture is every major artery has branches, just like a tree. So here's one of the major arteries, and you can see that it has a branch, and the branch has another branch, and you have all these other little guys over here. Uh, here, of course, I told you, always look for the arrow in the slide. You can see a narrowing here, and then a filling defect. So this artery should be this fat, and then over here it thins out, and then over here you don't see any black uh, dye going through. So that's a, that's a significant blockage here. Uh, so what do we do? We uh, do angioplasty, which we take a catheter, a wire. On the tip of the wire is a balloon. We inflate the balloon and we crush the cholesterol plaque that's formed over time. We deflate the balloon. We take out the balloon with via the catheter, right? We pull back. Some patients always ask me, do you leave the balloon inside? And the answer is no. We deflate the balloon. We take back the catheter and we put a nice stainless steel stent inside to keep the artery open. So here on the top slide, the wire goes through, the plaque gets crushed down. We then leave a stainless steel stent in place to keep the artery open, and everything looks very, uh, you know, very much normal at that point. You see in this particular slide, again, here's the arrow, 90% blockage. And then we do our magic, we do an angioplasty and then stent in place. And now with the double arrow, you see the blood flow is great. Okay, so you compare here to here, good blood flow. So this is a, a cardiac catheterization, the procedure with uh, angioplasty to deflate, uh, to uh, crush the plaque down, and then we leave the stent behind. Uh, the other thing you see in this picture, these wires here 
our coronary artery uh, bypass wires. So after a patient undergoes uh, coronary artery bypass surgery, when they have to open up the chest, they close it with these coat hanger-like wires. So uh, that's sometimes what you see here on the x-ray. Coronary artery bypass surgery is like you driving on the highway, there's an obstruction and you say, you know what, I'm gonna go around that obstruction and here this is a bypass graft from an artery to an artery and it hooks in over here. Uh, a vein bypass graft is taken from uh, the leg and then they bypass an area and they hook in downstream here with a vein bypass graft. So arterial grafts are uh, hooked up internally from the mammary artery. Sometimes they'll take an artery from the wrist, the radial artery, and they'll do bypass. The other important point to take home here is these are arteries that are on the surface of the heart and they, they, then they dive into the heart muscle itself. So we can't bypass everything because we're not digging into the heart muscle or bypassing the arteries on the surface of the heart. Also, as you've seen, if someone goes in for a bypass and they come out with three, four, five bypasses, uh, it's because all the different arteries have branches. And again, it's like a plumbing expedition. You know, you want to get as much plumbing improved when you go in for that. Uh, this is my friend Sam here. He doesn't have to worry about his diet because he's going for bypass surgery tomorrow. And the problem here with Sam is what I told you early on in the lecture is atherosclerosis affects the entire arterial tree. And uh, Sam may be bypassing one area, but the rest of his arterial tree has disease in it. So it's not a new lease on life to go may I return to poor lifestyle. It's a wake up call to be better at what you do, what you eat, and how you take care of your body if you need an intervention such as a stent or bypass surgery. So we all can't be like Sam here, happy and eating. Other things we do today in cardiology, uh, we can treat valve disease. So mitral valve prolapse, can, which can occur in 10% uh, of patients, is the dipping of the valve. The valve should be out here closing like clapping hands in this particular valve leaflet of the mitral valve is going backwards when it should be out here clapping hands. That's a mitral valve prolapse. So with patients that have a prolapse that's severe and they have a lot of regurgitation, a lot of backflow, where it's affecting the function of the heart and causing them symptoms, today we have something called a mitral valve clip, which is a size of a, a, size of a quarter. It's like a clothespin that you can insert onto the mitral valve leaflets via catheter, one of those wires, so nobody's opening the chest. So for the patients that meet criteria, a mitral valve clip can improve backflow or regurgitation, leakage of the mitral valve. So that's something new and exciting. Uh, the aortic valve is the last valve out of the body and the aortic valve can be born, uh, can be born with a bicuspid, two parts to the valve. Typically the aortic valve should have three cusps, like a uh, Mercedes sign or a peace sign over here, one, two, and three. Some people are born with one and two. And what happens when you have two parts to the valve, you can get calcium forming in your uh, fifth decade and sixth decade where the valve is not opening. We call that a fish mouth appearance. Then for uh, patients that get older, you can see this patient has three parts to the valve, three cusps, one, two, and three but it's not opening because there's all calcium here and calcium here that's causing the valve to close down. Uh, and today, we don't have to open the chest to replace the aortic valve. We can do a uh, transcatheter aortic valve replacement, again, through the groin with minor incision in the chest. It's less invasive than a traditional uh, opening your chest or thoracotomy procedure. And then the valves can go in and basically what they do in a simplifying manner is they put the valve in uh, through the groin, they crush down the calcium buildup over time, and they leave this valve sitting on your original valve uh, functioning as your new aortic valve. So that's available for us as well. So we can replace the aortic valve without having to open your chest. We can improve the mitral valve, a leaky mitral valve with a mitral valve clip. We talked about coronary artery revascularization, either through stent placement or bypass surgery. Uh, so when we talk about preventing the event, we talk about uh, beginning the plaque attack with screening. So you need to take the time. Spending time with the patients is very important. My professors used to say, how do you know the answer to someone's problem? 
take a good history and do a physical and listen to the patient. That's really a challenge because everything is go, go, go. And uh, you need to slow it down at some point and take the time to know your patient and really identify risk. So once we identify patients' cardiac risk factors, we highlighted some of them this evening, but there are also biomarkers of blood tests that we do look for uh, with relation to increased risk for cardiovascular disease. One of those risk markers is uh, high sensitivity C-reactive protein, which is a blood test looking at inflammation. I've highlighted the diagnostic tools that we utilize today, including stress testing, echocardiograms, looking at uh, other mechanisms uh, we use in diagnosis, a carotid Doppler examination, looking at the uh, carotid arteries uh, with sound waves, uh, looking at the uh, peripheral arterial disease in your legs using sound waves called the uh, ABI, or ankle brachial index, and cardiovascular stress testing. So that's the tools, but it all starts with patient, clinician engagement. Spend the time where you'll do the crime and not diagnose the disease when you really need to do it. And if you look at this uh, press release from many years ago uh, from the uh, World Health Organization, more than 50% of deaths and disability from heart disease and strokes can be cut by a combination of simple, cost-effective national efforts and individual actions to reduce major risk factors such as high blood pressure, high cholesterol, obesity, and smoking. So this was back in the day and they were identifying you know, major risk factors. And I can change the words around here with the same beginning and say, effective national efforts to wearing a mask and social distancing and washing your hands to reduce the risk for uh, cardiovascular events as well. So I think we need to learn from the past to do well in the present and that's very important for us because as you look at this particular curve here, you see we've gone from uh, years ago where we were so focused on uh, curing or dealing with acute events that over time we realized that we need to focus on prevention. And as we move to the 21st century and beyond, it's important for us to prevent clinical events. And we know what risk factors we need to hone in on. We know what we need to do, but it's important for the patient and the physician and clinician, uh, again, the clinician could be the physician, the nurse practitioner, the physician's assistant, uh, the registered dietitian. Everybody needs to be pulling in the same direction because if they're pulling in two different directions, the boat spins in a circle and we never go forward. So as we look to the 21st century and beyond, we need to look and focus on cardiovascular prevention. So with that, I'll end here and I hope that Everyone now is smarter than I am in uh, looking to re uh, reduce clinical events and therefore preventing the event. So thank you very much, Rachel, and thank you to the audience. I'm happy to answer any questions that we have. That was amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I think it was just such a perfect time for you to discuss the heart disease and the time with COVID. I know that this has very much been on people's minds and you are so right that we really need to work more towards sort of having this sweet spot. You know, I think where we, where we have patients that know when they need to be on medication, when they need a procedure, but how important lifestyle is. So I'd love for you to maybe touch on that a little bit where, for example, I get a lot of questions from my patients where perhaps they're not convinced about starting medication therapy, uh, maybe specifically a statin. They're not completely on board with that recommendation yet, and they want to try lifestyle first, or they want to try a natural remedy, if you will. I'd love for you to sort of touch on that. Um, I know I'm constantly kind of talking with patients about perhaps the dangers of supplementation, uh, when we can consider giving them a little time to work on lifestyle, when really we need to think about meds, if you could kind of touch on that a little bit. Sure. I think that's another great question. I think I've emphasized tonight that everything starts with proper lifestyle modification as the foundation for what we do. So we need to have proper diet, and that could be a Mediterranean diet for some. That could be a caloric control diet. So on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, we need to really work with the patient to find out what's the best diet for them. Some people may need weight loss. Some people may need uh, lipid lowering therapy. Uh, so I think that uh, really becomes important for us. Now, the other part of that is proper exercise and uh, 
it's recommended at least moderate aerobic activity of 150 minutes per week. Now saying that, and I have this on a daily basis, if you get your blood test back and your LDL cholesterol is greater than 190, so remember that number, I don't give you too many numbers to remember, 190 for your LDL cholesterol or greater, that's consistent with a disease state referred to as heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. In English, patients that have high cholesterol can run in families and that's an increased risk. Uh, the national guideline goal for that population is get the LDL below 100 because the longer you are exposed to high cholesterol, the greater your risk for earlier heart disease occurs. Uh, so that's a group there. The other thing I'll point out is uh, patients want to, you know, do things naturally. I hear that, uh, but you have to look at their risk. And we use risk calculators uh, to determine risk. So if someone does want to start with diet and exercise, and I feel that their risk uh, can tolerate that trial, we'll give them three to six months and see what they need to do. For patients that have a higher cholesterol, as I said earlier, statins are the foundation for what we do. They've been shown to be safe and very effective reducing clinical events. And statins do two things. They lower the cholesterol and they stabilize the plaque. Remember that plaque that causes the first heart attack is 50% or less. What's the treatment? Stabilize the plaque. So that's the role for statins. I uh, use the term remedies. People want natural activities. So red rice yeast, for those listening, is, quote, not so natural. The molecule of red rice yeast is the mother of all the statins. So they basically found the uh, active ingredient in red rice yeast to be uh, what would turn out to be statins. So for my patients that say, oh, I'm on red rice yeast, uh, that to me is medical therapy. That's not a natural remedy. And I will explain to them that they should be on uh, efficacious treatment, which are medications that have been shown to reduce clinical events. So for those where they can tolerate the risk, they should be on a proper diet, individualized to work for them. Part of what we do at the prevention center is we have a registered dietitian assess patients' uh, needs and goals, review that with them, and certainly add the uh, exercise foundation in there. Again, depending on the risk, would include weight loss as a goal as well and diabetes control uh, or hyper high blood sugar control. Because once patients are diabetic, the national recommendations, all diabetics should be on statin therapy. All diabetics should be on statin therapy. So that's an important message. Uh, we can argue with all diabetics uh, in a younger stage, you know, what do we do for them is a case by case basis, but the recommendations from national guidelines between the ages of 40 and 70, all diabetics should be on statin therapy. Absolutely. And, you know, just to piggyback on that, I think sometimes we really need to help patients understand that while something may sound natural and safe, uh, there is no regulation with over-the-counter medication. So any kind of supplementation, vitamins, those are not FDA regulated. So the likelihood that there's a benefit, while very small, there is a high chance that there might be, they may be harmful. You know, for example, having toxins in them, um, as Dr. Janos has mentioned with the over-the-counter fish oils, can uh, actually have saturated fat uh, in the pills. And so I think in general, when I'm trying to counsel people that I think there's this mindset in Western society where uh, if something is good for us, then, then mega doses of it must be good. You know, we OD on vitamin C so we don't get a cold. And uh, it's been talked about with vitamin D now for COVID. And I think in general, it's so important for us to help patients understand that unless you are deficient in a certain vitamin or mineral, ODing on something, taking mega doses of something is likely never going to be beneficial and may actually cause, cause harm as far as your body needing to work a little harder to excrete it or even being toxic at some times. I think, I think that's, that's, that's great and very well said. So uh, that's important. Sometimes I'll say to my patients, if you need statin therapy and you have a 40 to 50% reduction in a heart attack, that's like me sending you to Vegas. You want a 40 to 50% win at the table, or do you want a supplement or remedy that has 0% winning at the table? But by all means, keep betting on the losing number with uh, various supplements that have no clinical data. So uh, I think that's great. And certainly if you're deficient in any vitamin, uh, supplementation is appropriate. 
Uh, but inventing your own science is a fantasy that you can't really afford as life goes on uh, because you do increase your risk. Absolutely. And, and speaking of, uh, as far as the statins, uh, not only the benefits that, that they have as far as cholesterol lowering preventing events, uh, isn't there some data now that's showing that actually they may uh, have some benefits in regard to COVID as well? Yeah, I think that's another great question. Uh, you know, I'm a big fan of inflammation that causes cholesterol or plaque instability. And uh, statins have an anti-inflammatory effect. And various studies have shown that patients who have been admitted to the hospital on statin therapy uh, have had a better outcome than patients that weren't on statins. Uh, so this needs to be further elucidated. But again, the anti-inflammatory benefit of statins uh, may be uh, beneficial in those that get the COVID infection. So do not stop your statin therapy if you have COVID infection. Do not stop your ACE inhibitor ARB, as we talked about with hypertension. Uh, and I think that's great as we learn more about the inflammatory effects of COVID-19, we can see the benefit effects of some of our anti-inflammatory therapy. But there is some data showing already that statins have a protective effect. Absolutely. Thank you. No, thank you for uh, discussing that. And then I will ask one final question. Uh, we did have an audience question, and I want to honor that. Uh, you were mentioning uh, with the angioplasty, the, and you also just mentioned the unstable, the stable plaque. So the question was, when the stent is being placed, how are they keeping uh, the plaque from being crushed, breaking off in pieces, traveling? You know, what is the risk with that as far as having the stent placed? The risk... Uh... So, you know, basically it's, it's, the risk is small because it's a controlled uh, environment. Uh, if they felt it was a high risk procedure, some centers, you know, can uh, trap uh, small particles or small pieces downstream. But in most cases, the effect of a small uh, piece of cholesterol breaking off is negligible. Uh, the area of the blockage is well assessed during the procedure and some patients uh, they'll, they'll use a laser to trim it in certain centers, or they'll use a, uh, a cutter, if you will, a uh, uh, device that goes in there and kind of cuts out some of the uh, calcium buildup. So, there, you know, it's a very well-controlled situation. And when you think about it, you're controlling a uh, catheter, a wire that's going through the wrist or the groin, and then manipulating it in, in an artery that's millimeters in, in diameter and uh, deploying these stents. Uh, so the risk of that is very small. And uh, the operators, the people doing the procedures, the interventional cardiologists, you know, have it under control and certainly have uh, devices available to them if they think that would be a high risk uh, procedure or higher risk procedure with regard to that. Absolutely. Thank you so much for clarifying. And uh, I will wrap up the evening at this point. Um, I just want to thank you again, Dr. Mintz. It was just such an excellent presentation as always. And just so helpful, I think, for our patients to kind of understand not only how we help assess, but also how they can be involved as a partner in their healthcare. You know, I think that's really what we want is the patients to understand the risk, the treatment plan, the goals we have for them, so we can work together with them as a team and really hopefully optimize the risk factors as much as we can and prevent any adverse outcomes. Uh, as you said, that's really all any of us can do. Uh, lower those risk factors, optimize, and um, you know, prevent the event. It was just a, a perfect talk for tonight. So I do want to let you all know uh, that we will be doing this every month, and we will be picking topics that we think are helpful to the community, whether it's diet, exercise, uh, reducing risk, stress reduction. We will make sure to let you know uh, we are blessed uh, to have Dr. Mintz tonight. And then his colleague, Dr. Ben Hirsch, will be speaking for us next month in October. So I will make sure to get out the actual date and details to you all, as well as his topic. And um, we will likely be able to let you know what the next talk is going to be each time we meet with you guys and really just keep this going. And as I said, hopefully expanding to as many people as possible. Uh, the options for virtual meetings, and lectures really make it much more doable for more people to be involved. And that's really our goal, just to help reach as many people as we can. Uh, Dr. Minz only has so many hours in the day to see so many patients. So, you know, 
<laughs> we got to try and spread the love a little bit to the community. So thank you so, so much. Well, and <laughs> Rach, before we end up, uh, does Jonathan have the uh, answers to our survey questions? Thank you. Yes, our polling questions. Wow, I told you, you guys were brilliant. You got the leading cause of death correct right from the start. I didn't even need to do the lecture. <laughs> Heart disease, leading cause of death in women, and um, risk factors for COVID-19. What happened to the bottom of the survey, John? 100% all of the above. Rachel, Wow. people in the audience should give the lecture to me next time. I think <laughs> that's know, the way we got to do it. We can't answer as a panelist, so this was 100% the participants, so I couldn't even help out and, you know, pad the answers, so... I'm telling you, we have we have some great patients, and uh, I think that's just a testament to you, to Dr. Janos, you know, for how much uh, we really try to educate patients to empower them, you know, to 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 help be involved in their healthcare as well. So you um, you you pointed that out so well tonight. So I appreciate it so much. That's my pleasure, and I look forward to uh, working with uh, you guys again and whatever you need. And again. Everybody's going to start a new day tomorrow. Prevent the event. Be cardiovascular, heart smart. That's right. Absolutely. And um, thank you again, everyone. Please enjoy the rest of your evening. Have a great weekend. And we'll see you all next month. All right. Thank you.